When the smoke clears, did he get it? Field Sports Nation member Joe Wood goes out after rabbits 18th century style. A delicate smoky flavour, but then the green sauce really sets it off well. Sometimes it goes right, sometimes it doesn't. OK, birds have all gone. <laughs> I'm off to Cornwall to see the triumphs and tribulations of running a small shoot day. Do the people who want to regulate shooting really have the best interests of shooters and wildlife at heart? Deborah Hadfield investigates the backlash against the wave of new rules coming our way. We have a field tester item. Robbie Shedden from Cooney Country talks us through modern moderators. We're giving away gun dog gin. David is on the news stump and James Marchington has hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. We've come to the Lincolnshire Worlds to meet Joe Wood, a Field Sports Nation member who's a shooter, fisher, forager, bushcrafter and black powder enthusiast. I do a bit of shotgun shooting, a beat, beat on the estate here and we have beaters day and we do roof shooting and bits and bobs. I've also got a firearms licence so I shoot a 243 Seiko 85 and go after the deer on the estate. That's part and parcel of our relationship with the keeper here. So I like a variety, you know, I've got a 2-2 rifle that I go after rabbits and things as well. So um, I just like to keep it fresh and different and, you know, go after all sorts of different quarry. Today, Joe is shooting a reproduction Brown Bess musket made by Pedasoli. The Brown Bess was the standard British Army rifle for more than 100 years in the 18th and 19th centuries. This is a copy of the 1762 Grice version, which was... Um, used predominantly in the Indian and American territory conflicts around that period of time. But this was probably mo made most famous by the Napoleonic Wars in the hands of the British. We start by shooting a 0.75 calibre lead musket ball at a target about 25 yards away. That's more of a challenge than it sounds. Smoothbore muskets were never accurate. Certainly in the Napoleonic period, it was lines of infantry firing other lines of infantry, probably no more than, I mean, the British used to, you know, wait until the French got particularly close, um, certainly within 50 yards, and then work on the premise they could fire those three volleys in that one minute that it would take the French to get to their line, and those three volleys across two ranks, so six shots into that mass of men would be enough to stop them, and then follow it up with a bayonet afterwards. So yeah, it was, you know, it wasn't a particularly accurate musket, but the Napoleonic period saw the start of the rifled um, flintlocks coming in where accuracy then went out to 100, even 200 yards. Um, but this was very much massed infantry firing at massed infantry. Today, Joe will be loading shot rather than musket balls. He wants to shoot a rabbit for a fancy meal he is planning to cook up in the woods later. These turn up in old country estates where poachers and gamekeepers alike were using them and, um, you know, they will have loaded shot in them just as much as we do today and you know gone after them. I mean it's, it's a flintlock musket at the end of the day that the technology was around whether it was a sporting flintlock or whether it was a military spec one it was the same principle behind it so this just happens to be a military spec one with a slightly larger bore than maybe some of the smaller gauge that we use for fouling and things like that so so that's probably about 90 grains of powder in there just tap it down slightly then I put an 11 gauge wad over the top of that before the shot goes in. That goes down on top of the powder. Just making sure there's no air gaps in there. Then I give it a charge of shot. I think these are number fives. Um, and I just give that charge of shot down there. And then I've got a couple of card over wads just to put over the top to stop the shot falling out. <laughs> and again, I put one in to start with. Just charge that down. And then quite often I put a second one down just to make sure. And that's it loaded and then it just needs the pan charging so you put it onto half cock and that won't go off on half cock that's effectively the safety and then you just put a charge of powder into the uh, 
pan. And then I just push that charge down into the touch hole, close the frizzen, and then like I say, that's on half cock, that's safe. And then when you want to fire, you put it onto full cock and it will go off. And that's it loaded. I use the ball just for target shooting. Um, I wouldn't go after anything with a, with a musket ball. It's good fun to try and become more accurate with it and you know work on the different patches, the different size musket balls, just to try and get a bit of accuracy out of it. I mean, we're talking about 50 yards maximum, really, for accuracy. Um, but it's great fun to then load with shot, you know, and go for a hedgerow walkabout or a bit of roof shooting or something like that with it as well. It's not the best conditions for it, but it would be nice to try and walk a couple of hedgerows and either bump a couple of rabbits or if there's a pigeon that's brave enough to come past, we can have a go at that. You generally get one shot at it and then if you're near a warren, they all go scurrying underground relatively quickly. Um, and the difficulty is you've got to give it a lot of lead because of the, um, the way that the flintlock works there's a bit of a delay between the flash in the pan and the ignition in the, uh, in the breech. So you've got to give quite a lot of lead on an animal and keep going through it um, to be able to commit to it. You hold them on a shotgun license because it's a smooth bore. Um, and then you need a black powder acquire and keep license to buy the black powder at the same time. And once you've got those two licenses, you can fire shot or musket balls down it because it's a smooth bore, it's held on a shotgun license. The only difficulty is storage because obviously it's quite a long, it's a 42 inch barrel, so it's quite a long piece to store, but you can take the lock off relatively easily and get cabinets long enough for them to go into. So and once you've got all the necessary bits and you do a bit of research on what to fire from them, they're great fun to shoot, just not so much fun to clean. <laughs> <laughs> the rabbits aren't playing ball today. Fortunately, Joe has brought along a couple he shot earlier. Now he wants to cook them up bushcraft gourmet style. First of all, we'll need a fire. It's basically a Swedish torch, so it's, it's got a cross cut with a chainsaw on top of it. But then I've drilled down a hole into the centre of it and connected it with a hole just there. So you get, you get a decent airflow that goes up through it. I've put four screws into it so I can just sit a pan on top of it. And you can cook on it and it, it won't spread, won't cause a <laughs> local fire. Yeah. And when you're done with it, I can just roll it into the stream and put it yeah. out. Joe is going to hot smoke the rabbit loins. Firstly, he cures them, sprinkling on a mixture of salt, sugar, star anise, bay leaf and black pepper. I'll just give it 15 or so minutes in that just to firm it up and it'll take the smoke a little bit better. Of course, you can't have a proper meal in the woods without something decent to drink. True to form, Joe has that yeah. in hand. Blackberry wine that I made seven years ago, about 13%, I think. I thought we might try a bit of that. Tastes pretty good. Yeah, tastes um, quite porty actually, yeah. to be fair. Yeah, it's really nice. The rabbit has been curing for about 15 minutes, so it's time to rinse off the cure and get the smoker going. All it is is a pan, a bit of tin foil in the bottom just to try and protect the pan more than anything. And then I've got an old chip pan grill inside it, just inverted. And then all I'm putting inside is half a cup of rice three tablespoons of brown sugar and a tablespoon of Lapsang Souchon tea. And that just goes into the bottom of the pan. And then I'll lay the fillets on top. Like so. Put a bit of tin foil just to seal the pan. And then we'll pop it on the rocket stove. Fifteen minutes later, the rabbit is cooked through and smelling delicious. Joe serves it up on bread with a sauce he prepared earlier. Parsley, basil, mint, garlic, capers, anchovies, olive oil, just all mixed up and made it last night. Just quite a nice sauce to go with. Game, just adds a little bit of something extra. There we have it. Tastes great, it's just sort of a delicate smoky flavour, but then the green sauce really sets it off well. Mm. Not bad for the woods. <laughs> That's just for starters. Next, Joe fries up Munchak and Roe fillets. 
He covers them in foil and leaves them to rest for 10 minutes while he fries an onion and stirs in a few spoonfuls of homemade plum jam to make a chutney. Then he serves it all up in pita bread. That munjak is so good. You're up next. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's the roe tenderloin, cooked nice and quickly, bit of salad, bit of pita, pita bread, onions, and then homemade plum jam just mixed up to make a bit of a sauce. Tastes great. You can find Joe on Instagram, link below. Thank you, Joe. Now this week's prize is more gin. We've given away enough free booze in recent weeks to feed quite a dependency. This one is Gundog Gin. If you'd like to know how to enter the draw, watch the Field Sports Nation's own TV show Field Sports Extra, which is out on Tuesdays, and you can do that by joining the Field Sports Nation for £5 a month. Now dropping him in the drink for yet another week, it is David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Scottish wind turbines have killed dozens of endangered birds. That's the conclusion of a report from Nature Scott, which reveals that 33 raptors have died after flying into the structures since 2019. The report shows that 2019 was one of the worst years for wind farm incidents, with 12 deaths, including five ospreys and one white-tailed eagle, at sites in the Highlands. Conservative MSP Sir Edward Mountain is pushing for more details about the deaths and warns they might be the tip of the iceberg. The report comes as the SNP is hoping to more than double Scotland's onshore wind capacity. The government has introduced a mandatory three-week quarantine for caught-up birds in England. The rules apply to pheasants, partridges and mallards. DEFRA says the restrictions will help stop the spread of bird flu. It applies from the last bird caught before movement to another premises. Gamekeepers should keep records of catching up, including the start date and final date of catching, and daily records of numbers caught. They should also keep records of daily mortality and reasons for any birds being culled. DEF has banned movements from protected or surveillance zones to areas outside of these. It will allow sufficient time for people to observe the birds on their site to make sure that they're not infected by avian influenza. And if you happen to be on a site that is an infected premises, the ramifications are really quite serious. So this is why we all need to play our part to stop this onward spread. A huge response to the lead ammunition consultation has sent the civil service into a tailspin. The health and safety executive announces it is postponing publication of its proposals to restrict the use of lead ammunition. It says in view of the overwhelming response, it is delaying releasing its opinions and response by six months. The agency received nearly 3,000 responses, including detailed and technical submissions. The figure is nine times that of a similar exercise conducted in Europe, which also saw a six-month extension. The HSE says that responses need to be worked through. As part of the announcement, the HSE says it's now looking at what it calls alternative risk management options for lead ammunition. The RSPB has appeared on BBC's Countryfile TV show calling for the release of pheasants for shooting to be stopped because of bird flu. In a one-hour programme which showed the economic, social and environmental benefits of shooting, filmed on the 12,500-acre Rieg estate in North Wales, RSPB spokesman Jeff Knott said pheasants are affected by the current strain of avian influenza. When the BBC pressed him for evidence, Mr Knott admitted it hasn't been proven that pheasants transfer the variant into wild bird populations. We approached the RSPB for a comment. In a statement, Mr Knott said that the RSPB fears that releasing pheasants helps bird flu spread. He adds that this is unnecessary and avoidable and that halting pheasant releases in 2023 would make a difference and could be done very quickly if the will was there. Staying with the RSPB and it's advertised an unusual vacancy in Northern Ireland. You can earn between £26,000 and £29,000 a year killing ferrets on Rathlin Island off the north coast of Antrim. The money comes from the £4.5 million that the National Lottery and taxpayers are giving the RSPB to kill all the rats and ferrets on the 3,000-acre Rathlin Island, which works out at an incredible £1,500 per acre. 
Locals introduced ferrets to Rathlin in the 1980s to combat the rabbit population and soon found that they eat rare birds too. You will need a firearms license and you will lead what the RSPB calls the ferret educational team in the field and maintain traps across the island. You will also have to learn to look mournful. The RSPB usually opposes predator control and a spokesman points out that no one gets into this work because they like killing animals. Link to the vacancy below. Antis have jumped on the bandwagon after Elon Musk reposted a picture of a man posing behind a large dead animal. In his tweet, the Tesla and Twitter owner commented, eight years later and still no laws. The original post said, this guy thinks it's cool to kill defenseless animals, then take a selfie. The picture, of course, from 2015 was of film director Steven Spielberg with a plastic triceratops from the 1993 Jurassic Park movie. The original post was a prank and the prankster followed up with a picture of Spielberg from the set of the movie Jaws in 1975 with the caption, folks, we need your help identifying this vicious shark killer shown posing with this illegal prey. The French government is introducing a ban on hunting under the influence of alcohol. It comes after months of fierce debate over hunting regulations following a series of hunting related deaths. A new fine will be created to sanction the act of hunting under the excessive influence of alcohol. According to a French Senate report, 9% of hunters involved in a severe accident test positive for drugs or alcohol. The French government ruled against more stringent proposals such as an outright hunting ban for one day at the weekends. The president of the European Union, Ursula von der Leyen, has taken sides in the wolf cull debate. A wolf killed her pony Dolly at her home in Germany. DNA samples revealed that the animal had also killed other livestock in the area. Officials in Hanover issued a permit for the wolf to be hunted and shot, which is rare under EU rules. After the pony's death, von der Leyen ordered commission officials to re-evaluate the rules that strictly protect wolves in Europe. She is now on the side of German farmers who claim the wolf population in Germany is increasing by 33% each year. An MP from New Zealand has taken part in one of the most prestigious shooting competitions on the islands. Nicole McKee MP shot the Ballinger Belt, New Zealand's oldest sporting trophy held near the capital Wellington. McKee competed in the Wellington Rifle Association Championships, one of the warm-up events to the Belt Series. She points out that this is the first year that shooters competed for the Belt under the new King's banner. She says she didn't shoot her best, but had a wonderful time with friends on the range. Thanks to Nick Olden for the story. And finally, a member of Scott Country International was out filming in South Ayrshire with a Hick Micro Thermal and got an eyeful. He was tracking a heron in flight in all its glory when he got more than he bargained for. The bird emptied its bowels as it was flying and the moment was caught on the unit. Definitely hot stuff. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stuck in the stories, fishing for facts. Buying shooting kits? Then head to Kit Finder and our team will help you find the right product at a fair price from dealers all over the UK. Kit Finder, the shooting kit comparison website. Thank you, David. Next, I'm off on a lovely small syndicate day in Cornwall, where what goes up doesn't always come down and what they put down is rarely what ends up in the bag. Yeah, load up. we'll load up in the truck a minute anyway. A small shoot day keeps you on your toes. Sometimes the birds fly where they are supposed to. Sometimes they don't. It's all a bit low, wouldn't they? You need to do what you are told, except when you need to show initiative. This Labrador has bags of initiative. We are out for a day in North Cornwall on a family-run shoot for locals. Here is one of four syndicate members to describe it. We are now on Trentini Farm, which I, 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 I'm not sure of the exact acreage, but it's probably about 140 acres mixed grazing land for sheep and cattle. It goes up, I don't know what the altitude here is, but it runs down to some valleys, runs down to the lower end of the valley, going to the St. Hugh Valley, and on our on the left-hand side of this line of trees is Trevathan Farm, owned by the Simmons family. And these are the two farms which uh, uh, we have our shoot on. Right, you just heard a bang? Yeah. You need to it. Yeah. Rob is in the hot seat for this drive, and they are good quality, high West Country birds. 
by the end of it, he's happy. I think that was very good. That was lovely. Nice spread of few birds to start the day. Yeah, really lively. Mark Simmons from Trevathan Farm is in charge of the day, with plenty of help from everyone else who is out too. I think line up below, wouldn't you? I would have thought so for a minute, we'll just try it. Are you going to stay this side, B, and then work in a little bit? I think. We'll go the other end and then come through. You have to be ready for whatever comes out. There was a lot of banging up there, wasn't there? There was. Well, a lot of that first flush we had on that last drive. Yeah. Must have gone down there somewhere. Well, it could have been a squirrel. <laughs> Now, you may recognise that voice. It belongs to Field Sports Channel regular Ian Hodge, who runs gun shop Ian Hodge Field Sports from his family's farm outside Wadebridge. Ian was at school with shoot organiser Mark. We've known each other all our lives. But he trusts you with a radio. Yeah, yeah, I'm a very important man with a radio. <laughs> and this is a very informal, but it covers everybody. We've got, we've got doctors, property developers in the syndicate, farmers, um, gun shop owner even. And we put back into the environment, we, we, we control the, the foxes, obviously, which then benefits all the other ground nesting birds and so on. We, as you go about, you see so much wildlife here on the two farms. And we have you know, bags of 40 to 50. We all go home with a brace. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good family orientated shoot. We got youngsters beating and picking up. Yeah, they love it. Well, it's a rough shoot, really. We do try to do a few drives, um, not too formal. Uh, we, we put down about a thousand pheasants, a couple of hundred ducks, and we had usually about a hundred partridges. This year we didn't get partridges because of avian flu and so on. They weren't available. But um, yeah, so we've got about a syndicate of six of us and two farms running over. We just had, just done another small uh, drive over another farm, neighbour's farm, trying to get that one going. But, um, I mean, you're standing in front of a very impressive cover crop. I mean, you take it seriously. Yeah, we do try to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't always work. It's, it's whether you can find the birds at the right time. Get in there. There's one in there, dog. Heel. We in there. We in there. We in there. There's one running legging out there. Okay, birds have all gone. <laughs> get on there. We in there. We in there. We in there. We, we end up with a bag that's enough for everyone to take home. It is what shooting is, at its best, a lovely day. Thank you, Mr. Hodge, for asking me along. Now, shooting needs your help. The organisations are doing some organising, a backlash against all the rules that Westminster, Cardiff, Hollywood and Stormont keep sending our way. Deborah Hadfield finds out what and why. Field sports groups claim shooting is under threat from over-regulation. You can't shoot a magpie in Wales, but you can in England. The Scottish Government plans to restrict the use of gun dogs, and DEFRA wants a ban on lead air gun pellets. Aim to sustain the partnership of rural organisations, including Basque, the Countryside Alliance, and the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, is fighting back by making the case for self-regulation in shooting. They're collecting evidence about how shoots benefit the countryside and they want you to take part. This tool, it will enable us to collect a lot of data which will help us to formulate and consolidate good practice uh, across game shoots and across all the um, shooting community. And that's incredibly valuable as we um, develop self-regulation and thereby providing confidence to government and the general public that the shooting community is a force for good for nature conservation, uh, rural economies, and these wider social benefits as well that uh, we are increasingly recognising. Scotland is on the cusp of making shooting grouse more difficult and introducing a licensing regime for grouse moors. The Scottish Government says it's trying to counter claims of poor and illegal practice by gamekeepers. In response to Professor Werity's review that was published in November 2020, the Scottish Government ignored recommendations to consider a licensing scheme should incidents of raptor persecution not significantly decrease over the following five-year period. Instead, it was decided that anyone who shoots grouse, whether driven or walked up, should be licensed and a public consultation was launched at the end of 2022. The Wildlife Management Grouse Bill is also being used as a vehicle to introduce restrictions relating to trapping and snaring as well as muirburn. The Welsh Government says it's anti-shooting. It's set to ban snares. 
One risk of new legislation is that antis in government can use it to introduce wider restrictions than politicians originally promise. If we don't have effective self-regulation, then I, I think it's fairly clear that there will be statutory regulation. And that statutory regulation will, would involve wider stakeholder consultation and in it will involve many that are not directly involved in game management or indeed have a, a moral objection to game shooting. And so uh, that could negatively impact the sector, which then could potentially be damaging for the environment, rural economies and the social benefits that we know that shooting provides too. A number of concerns have been raised by rural organisations and some are technicalities within the bill, which will make the administration more onerous than it should be. There are major questions over who should be licensed and what this means for landowners. As it stands, the wording is such that any wildlife crime committed on that land may result in the license being revoked. This is in direct contradiction of the reason why the bill was brought about, which was specifically to tackle rats persecution alone. Aim to sustain hopes that the results of its shoot survey will later rest the spectre of raptor persecution by gamekeepers, which the RSPB and others used to tarnish the image of shooting. Most shoots and most people involved in shooting operate to very high standards, but it's always the minority uh, that are the ones that are bringing the sector into disrepute. And these are the ones that unfortunately hit the headlines. And so all the good work, the positive work that goes on, tends to go unnoticed or, or is underreported. And I also sense that there's a, a growing frustration within uh, the shooting community that it feels misunderstood or misrepresented. So Aim to Sustain, as an umbrella organisation, seeks to address this and, and through uh, the development of a set of self-regulation standards, this will help the sector be viewed in a more positive light by those who question, for example, the environmental credentials of, uh, of shoots. GWCT research shows that when shoots follow best practice guidelines, they deliver biodiversity benefits. Self-regulation, it can only really be effective if all those who are involved are actively engaged in that process and indeed on board with the self-regulatory mechanisms that uh, will likely develop over the next few months. The Scottish Government continues to squeeze every sector within rural Scotland. Wildlife management and shooting in general are really under the cosh and the knock-on effect is ultimately a negative impact on endangered species and a reduced income for thousands of rural workers and employers. There are three parts to the survey, which is open until the end of January. If you'd like to take part, see the links below. Thanks, Deborah. Now let's head to Cleany Country to learn about a new line in Scandi Moderators. Now, Robbie, last time I was here, I was taken by these very cute little moderators you have here. You distribute these, you bring them into the country, don't you? We do indeed. We've been bringing them in for about a year and a half, two years. This is the Freer and Devic Featherweight line, the 149, the 196 and the 269. They are unbelievably small, light, compact moderators, but their um, weight to suppression ratio is amazing. They have a titanium core and thread, and then the baffle stack in them is aluminium. However, Albeit that these are remaining current, we have some exciting news for you, which is we have a couple of prototypes here from Freer and Devic. These new little beauties are actually it's quite amazing. I'm a bit baffled by it myself. Excuse the pun. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was unintentional. So. These little beauties here have 3D printed titanium internals. The entire baffle stack, which I think is something people have been asking us about certainly, is completely grade five, 3D printed titanium, offering unbelievable weight to suppression ratio, as well as, dare I say it, maintenance free. The, um, the anti-corrosive properties of titanium is unbelievable. So we are very excited about these. I know the manufacturer, Freer and Devic, has also tested them vigorously already and they're having absolutely no problems. So we're very, very excited to get the um, actual first production line of these and get them into people's hands because I think they will be unbelievable moderators. Do you get a real sort of 
surprise reaction when people do pick them up. They're deceptive, aren't they? Definitely, definitely. Half the time I just don't say very much, even if people haven't heard of them, and I just place it in their hand and they go, oh wow, because it's, I mean, the days of T8s and these big heavy steel things are, I think, gone. And everything is compact. I mean, that one there, this the prototype, the UTS, Ultimate Silence 3D, because obviously they're 3D printed, as we said. That is actually a Magnum rated moderator, which, as I say, because of the titanium internals, is just an insane performer for what is 231 grams. Thanks, Robbie. And that line of featherweight moderators is available now. Next, from Nordic silence to the loudest and proudest hunting and shooting films on YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First up this week, Alan Johnson of Danem Outdoors tells the story of a stalk that didn't go to plan. He shoots a row, then struggles to find it, but it turns out well in the end. Over to the States and friends Matt, Jack and Tyler have a great day decoying Canada geese in a snowstorm. Randy Anderson and his mate Ryan are hunting coyotes in the snow. The tension builds as a pack of five come into the call. Meanwhile in Texas, Sydney Wells is bow hunting and has some close encounters with deer and feral hogs. Back to the UK and our own Paul Childerly is in the hot seat for Jack Pike's Spot Shot series. Stuart from Vermin Control Scotland kicks off the year with an epic session shooting rats with his air gun and a Hick Micro Alpex night scope. Here's an action-packed New Year's Day of ferreting with the Rabbiting On channel. Using nets, whippets and lurchers. Finally, one you could only find in the States. Nine-year-old Autumn Fry from Pennsylvania has amassed more than 200,000 subscribers, testing a huge variety of handguns, rifles and shotguns. In her latest video, she's having fun with a rusty old 20 ball she's nicknamed the Apocalypse Shotgun. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link. Charlie at Fieldsport channel.tv well that's it for this week if you haven't done so already please whiz over to our website fieldsportschannel.tv where you can click to like us on facebook and on instagram you can follow us on twitter subscribe to us on youtube pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show field sports britain which is at 7 p.m uk time every wednesday and this has been field sports britain good hunting good shooting good fishing and goodbye